Good afternoon and welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier. My article over the weekend was captioned, The Markets Are Run By Machines, Computers, Algorithms and Bots. Once upon a time, many years ago, the markets were traded on the phone and a human had to speak to another human in order to trade. You read the paper on the way to work, the TV was always on. You relied on a trusted network of humans in different parts of the world. That time feels as long ago as a fairy tale. I recall in the 1990s when the internet arrived on the trading floor. Today, as The Economist headlined October 5th, it is the march of the machines. The stock market is now run by computers, algorithms and passive managers. Morningstar reported that for the first time, the pot of passive equity assets it measures was at $4.3 trillion and exceeded that pot run by humans. The financial markets are a bot world with bots trading with each other. And there is clearly a convergence with computational propaganda. The University of Oxford's Oxford Institute Computational Propaganda Research Project produced a research piece which spoke of the use of algorithms, automation and big data to shape public life is becoming a pervasive and ubiquitous part of everyday life. Cambridge Analytica's now infamous Andrew Nix said, we just put information into the bloodstream, to the internet and then watch it grow Give it a little push every now and again over time to watch it take shape. And so this stuff infiltrates the online community and expands with no branding, so it's unattributable, untraceable. So the candidate is the puppet, the undercover reporter asked, always replied Mr. Nix. Practically every trading day now and for over a year, President Trump recycles the same headline. The latest iteration, Donald Trump says China trade talks moving very nicely, claiming Beijing wants deal more than the US. Recycle the same headline over and over and over again, and each time markets jump, and each time it means nothing tweeted Northman Trader. You know why algos buy unsubstantiated headlines? Because they are stupid, Northman Trader. This feedback loop has lifted stock markets, particularly in the United States, to all-time highs and there's been a spillover into other developed markets. The human institutional memory has been eroded and if you traded on the basis of fundamentals, you would have been stopped out a decade ago. This is a house of cards of simply monstrous proportions and has been bulked up with the steroids of free money, negative interest rates and QE. And that took me to the hollow men, T.S. Eliot. Here we go round the prickly pear, the prickly pear, prickly pear. Here we go round the prickly pear at five o'clock in the morning. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. Not with a bang, but a whimper. Interestingly, last week we saw a reversal of the overwhelming safe haven demand we had witnessed all year. Gold had its worst week in two years, G7 government bonds sold off, the US 10-year printed its highest yield since mid-September, trading above 1.9%. The German 10-year yield was at its highest since mid-July, and French 10-year yields crossed into positive territory. The global markets pirouette on the outcome of the trade war. 
South China Morning Post News carried an article. Trade negotiator who got China into WTO is rooting for Trump's re-election because Twitterer-in-chief is easy to read. Donald Trump, whose trade war with China has upended global supply chains and imperiled the world's economic growth, would be most welcome with another four years in the White House because he is easier to read than other American politicians, said the negotiator who led China's entry into the World Trade Organization. The US President's daily Twitter posts broadcast his every impulse, delight and peeve to 67 million followers around the world, making him easy to read. And the best choice in an opponent for negotiation, said Long Yong Tu, the former Vice Minister of Foreign Trade and point man during China's 15-year talks to join the WTO nearly two decades ago. Now it's clear that Trump is playing a game and he's played it rather well. And it is also within Xi's power to absolutely crash the US market by simply pronouncing that no trade deal is possible and the US stock indices will sink as far as the US farm economy has sunk and with it Trump's re-election chances. And my final point is that whilst the Twitter in chief is easy to read, I am not sure he is the decider. The risk of bot and algorithmic mayhem is sky high. And I'm not sure pumping the patient with more QE and free money will do the trick next time around. The bots will be waiting for Santa Claus and a Christmas rally. So as President Trump is wont to tweet, stock market up big today, a new record in joy. So as I was, I was referencing that article in the South China Morning Post, that link is on Rich Wrap-Ups. Trade negotiator got China into WTO for Trump's re-election um, because Twitter-in-chief is easy to read. Best choice in an opponent for negotiations. He said Trump talks about material interests, not politics. Such an opponent is the best choice for negotiations, he said. Balding's World tweeted, This is the new line that Beijing really wants Trump to win, but even the people sent to spew this nonsense can't pull it off. And then again, Ray CCP on Trump. When CCP say this, they've already misread America. True that Trump's tweets tell, tells a lot about what's in Mr. Trump. But what China miss is that unlike authoritarian rule under which one man can decide everything, Trump can't negotiate with China at will. And I wrote about this on the 27th of May when I said the China-US war was going ballistic. And I said the point being in the trade war, Trump is no longer the decider. In the US, there is clearly a consensus baseline for a full-on to full toe-to-toe slugfest, as it were. And um, notwithstanding all the hyperbole and the very partisan commentary, the following are the plain truths. So, in my opinion, Z is the decider, but Trump isn't. The markets, I said at that time, are still pricing in a benign, but much less benign than a month ago outcome, that was in May. We need to consider what a non-benign or even maximum non-benign outcome looks like. But, interestingly, when you think of the art of the deal, Z, who is the decider in China, does have the capacity to crush the US stock market and with it POTUS's re-election chances. And that is a signal that we have to hear through the noise. Macro thoughts, markets are so levered and entwined with equities and Fed monetary moves, macro data has for now lost all meaning. We don't have free markets, but a stockonomy dependent on all-time highs. That's Brad Houston. Northman Traders tweets recycle the same headline over and over and over again, and each time markets jump, and each time it means nothing. You know why algos buy unsubstantiated headlines? Because they're stupid, he said. 
to which Navarro says Trump will not roll back tariffs for phase one trade deal with China. There's no rollback at all. So we need all the tariffs there, but the tariffs are really our best insurance policy as well to make sure that the Chinese are negotiating in good faith. Well, they'd like to have a rollback. I haven't agreed to anything, Trump told reporters, adding China would like to get somewhat of a rollback, not a complete rollback, because they know I won't do it. Um, so that's clearly rowing back from the reconciliation position. And if you listen to Navarro's interviews, implying that the Chinese are using Western media in order to put pressure on the US. Now let's turn to the markets. I was talking about the big sell-off in the G10, the G7 bond markets. Bond Magedon. No, we have been here before, says JS Blockland. It's actually a triple high, triple uh, uh, high in price, triple uh, low in yield, according to Blockland's chart. 1st of April, I was talking about it, but there certainly being a fin de siècle, even apocalyptic mood afoot. And I said the conundrum, for those who wish to bet on the end of the world, is this. However, what would be the point the world would have ended? And to it, we're seeing people backing off from that position. The jump in US bond yields last week was in the 99th percentile over the last decade, chart by IV underscore technicals. US 10-year yield is in wave 3 of 5 up and has a DMARC sequential countdown on day 12 of 13, according to Tommy Thornton. Simple Trends posted a chart of liquidity, I mean Bitcoin versus the S&P. As I said, uh, I am of the view that Bitcoin and crypto is a Jeffrey Edward Epstein in his cast of characters level con, and I'm having nothing to do with it. This is Mr. W. Wolf, his Bitcoin prediction. We're currently at 8,825. The problem with Bitcoin is it can be squeezed higher in a blink of an eye and carry everybody out. Very interesting article I came across by J.P. Koning, The Gamification of Bitcoin. The thing that fooled us for a while, myself included, is that we all thought Bitcoin was solving a monetary or a payments problem. It was labelled a coin after all, and coins fall within the realm of monetary economics. To further complicate matters, Satoshi told his story using phrases like electronic cash system and non-reversible transactions. Perhaps we deserve to be forgiven for not seeing Bitcoin's underlying nature. After all, tearing down the existing monetary system and building a new one was a fresh and exciting narrative. What is now apparent is that Bitcoin was never a monetary phenomenon. No Bitcoin is a new sort of financial betting game. It is a digital, global, highly secure and fairer version of the old-fashioned chain letter. The premise behind Bitcoin the game is that the current wave of buyers must guess when or if a subsequent wave of buyers will emerge, this second next wave's participation being contingent on when or if they believe a third wave of buyers to emerge. If they guess right, the early birds win at the expense of the late ones, then they can win a lot of money, as Coinbase points out in its post. Think of Bitcoin as a pure mind game, a Keynesian beauty contest in which we devote our intelligences to anticipating what average opinion expects the average opinion to be. These old-fashioned chain letters that you or your parents used to get in the mail were an early type of beauty contest. The price that Alice was willing to place on a chain letter was a function of whether she expected the next recipient, Bill, to play by the rules and send it on. Bill's expectation, in turn, depending on the odds, that Jack would join the game. But chain letters had a major flaw. The chain order could easily be compromised by a fraudster who miscopied the list and put their name at the front. Bitcoin fixes this by introducing robustness to chain letter type games. Bitcoin's blockchain is an unbreakable public record of where inline game players stand. Bitcoin the game has been spectacularly successful. It went from an idea in 2008 
first transaction in 2009 to over 27 million users in the US alone in 2019, or 9% of Americans. Why did Bitcoin the game succeed? First, it's fun and a cutting edge, edge game. Secondly, the way that Bitcoin is designed helps it spread. Um, Bitcoin is different because it is decentralized and a digital financial game. It can't be regulated or shut down, so it can serve the entire globe with impunity, which it has done by spreading into every crack and cranny on earth, as is illustrated by a number of Coinbase's charts. The promise of mainstream Bitcoin payments has died a thousand deaths over the last 11 years. That being said, the demand for Bitcoin in economically volatile regions such as Venezuela has hit record highs. Coinbase suggests that thanks to inflation and capital controls, Bitcoin is finally being used as the electronic cash for which it was originally designed. Bitcoin's popularity in Venezuela is also consistent with the Bitcoin as game narrative. When people are desperate to improve their lives, they may have little other option but to roll the dice. In run, Lola run, Lola needs to quickly make a hundred thousand Deutschmarks to save her boyfriend's life. She races to a casino and plays roulette. Likewise, in the face of societal collapse, Venezuelans may be simply be gambling on whatever potentially life-changing bet they can find. Bitcoin is one such bet. Unwinding what portion of Venezuelan usage is due to Bitcoin as game versus Bitcoin as money is tricky. As I've suggested before, there is demand as such for financial games and bets, specifically early bird bets. Compared to many of the fly-by-night games out there, Bitcoin provides a fair and trustworthy option. 27th of November 2017, I wrote Bitcoin while wow, what a ride, which is Bitcoin the game. It is a Kirby driven feels unmistakably. It is the parabola they must have guessed once or twice guessed and refused to believe that everything always collectively had been moving toward that purified shape latent in the sky, that shape of no surprise, no second chance, no return. Um, and I quoted T.S. Eliot, the hollow men, between the idea and the reality, between the motion and the act falls into shadow for dying is the kingdom. And I was saying then my investment thesis at the start of the year was that Bitcoin was going to get mainstreamed in 2017. And I said it had mainstreamed beyond my wildest dreams and therefore I was sidelined. And then I left you with Hunter S. Thompson, life should not be a journey to the grave with the intention of arriving safely in a pretty and well-preserved body but rather to skid in broadside in a cloud of smoke, thoroughly used up, totally worn out, and loudly proclaiming, wow, what a ride. Um, and then I was also saying that it's a little bit like Ebola. It has escape velocity. Viruses exhibit non-linear exponential characteristics, which Bitcoin does, and Ebola was doing. And then I was touching on the high-tech millennial crypto avocado economy exhibiting viral wildfire and exponential and even non-linear characteristics. And I defined it as a zeitgeist of a time, as its defining spirit or its mood. And I said the crypto avocado millennial economy captures the zeitgeist of the now. And that was because we're living in a dizzyingly fluid moment. I've got the hollow men, Mr. Kurtz, he dead. Between the conception and the creation, between the emotion and the response falls the shadow. Life is very long. Between the desire and the spasm, between the potency and the existence, between the essence and the descent falls the shadow of the time is the kingdom. This is the way the world ends, not with a bang, but a whimper. Average screen time exposure per adult in quarter four 2018 exceeded nine hours per day. Oof. I really like this chap, Carlos Cruz Diaz, who I've discovered recently, and I've got three examples that I like. Induction chromatique a double frequence, induction pour cambio de frequencia 101, and induction pour cambio de frequencia 102. 
I want to tell you the story of Kabir, which was recounted by Swami Svivananda. When Kabir died, his body was claimed by both the Hindus and the Mohammedans. The king of Kashi, with thousands of Hindus, wanted to cremate the body. The Hindus claimed that Kabir was a Hindu and that therefore his body should be burnt. Bisli Khan, with thousands of Mohammedans, wanted to bury it. The Mohammedan said that Kabir was a Muslim and therefore his body ought to be buried under Mohammedan rites. While they were quarrelling, Kabir's apparition appeared and said, I was neither a Hindu or a Mohammedan. I was both. I was nothing. I was all. I discerned God in both. There is no Hindu and no Muslim. To him who is free from delusion, Hindu and Muslim are the same. Remove the shroud and behold the miracle. The shroud was removed, a large quantity of flowers was seen under it. Half of the flowers was taken by the king of Kashi and burnt on the bank of Holy Ganga. The ashes were then buried and a temple was built. This temple is known by the name of Kabir Chora, a great place of pilgrimage for the followers of Kabir. The other half of the flowers were taken by the Mohammedans and buried at Mogar, where Kabir died. A mosque was built over the grave. This is a place of pilgrimage for the Mohammedans. This is a photograph of the Darga and Samadhi of great Saint Kabir Das. And of course, my favorite poem is, of his is the swing between the poles of the conscious and the unconscious. There has the mind made a swing. Thereon hang all beings in all worlds. And that swing never ceases its sway. Millions of beings are there. The sun and the moon in their courses of their millions of ages pass, and the swing goes on, all swing. The reason I touched on that story, I'll come to in a moment. There's a short pictorial of the 30th anniversary of the end of the Berlin Wall, that's from Consortium News. But the reason I was touching on Kabir was because of the Ayodhya verdict. The site of the destroyed Babri Masjid Mosque must be given to Hindus for construction of a Ram temple the Supreme Court has ruled. The Ayodhya dispute or Ram Jam Bhumi Babri Masjid land title dispute is a political, historical and socio-religious debate in India centered on a plot of land in the city of Ayodhya. The Babri Masjid Mosque of Babur is believed that one of his generals, Mir Baki, built the Babri Masjid Mosque in 1528 on his orders. Both the Hindus and Muslims are said to have worshipped at the mosque temple. Muslims inside the mosque, Hindus outside the mosque, but inside the compound. And uh, uh, obviously the Hindus believe that this is, once upon a time, this is where Ram was born. And I'd go back to something I wrote on the 21st of October when I said leadership in the 21st century has become nationalistic and jingoistic. Horizons have been narrowed. Narendra Modi is all about the Hindutva. At the moment of vision, the eye sees nothing. Um, and I said the moment of vision is, in essence, a non-linear thing. It's a moment of deep insight. And I think Kabir had more insight. Rama, or Ram, also known as Ramachandra, is a major deity of Hinduism. He is the seventh avatar of the god Vishnu. The Rama story is carved into stone as an 8th century relief artwork in the largest Shiva temple of the Ellora Caves, suggesting its importance to the Indian society by then. Many have spoken over this spring, but they were gone in the twinkling of an eye. We conquered the world with bravery and might, but we did not take it with us to the grave, is an inscription that Emperor Babur wrote somewhere along the journey. Lula is free. Just before 5 p.m. on Friday, the 8th of November, Brazil's former president, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, walked out of his prison in Curitiba, Brazil. Um, and this is a big deal. It must be chilling for Bolsonaro to watch the television and see Lula walk confidently out of his prison and into the political domain. Elections have brought the left back to power in Argentina, with the left retaining power in Bolivia. Even in Colombia, the left has made significant gains. Mass protests in Chile and Ecuador suggest the tide has turned in those two countries. Bolsonaro must, now, must know that the turn to the left of Brazil is imminent. The left now has its champion out on the streets. President Bolsonaro pronounced, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. This is some footage from that via Herve Lula Libre. He also said, Unga trails of death and destruction 
ideologically infected human souls and biologically perverted children. An unidentified foreign drone was shot down in Iran, say news agencies, the Iranian army shot down an unidentified foreign drone near the port of Bandar e Mashra on the Gulf Coast. And then I saw some YouTube link which says that Russia secretly delivered S-400 systems to Iran. Protest all day, party all night, how rave is uniting the Lebanese rebellion. The wave of protest in, Lebe in Lebanon has been defined by hard party rather than destruction and violence. It's midnight on a Tuesday night in Beirut and a crowd is forming around a white van that has pulled up in Martyrs Square. A dense cloud of smoke is being spewed out from the squealing tires of a nearby BMW. And through it moves a mishmash of street children, wealthy students, shirtless men wearing masks, some are shouting at two figures scrambling over the roof of the van, tying down speakers and plugging in cables. It's nine days since Lebanese protesters spontaneously took to the streets after a raft of new taxes were announced, including a 29 cent daily charge on voice calls made through WhatsApp. Until recently, I'd never been to a protest before, says Fonzo, but I went to Martyrs Square and saw the flags everywhere. I knew that this time it was different. For Goose, like many others in Lebanon, the DIY protest raves are a powerful symbol at a time of extreme political uncertainty with potentially grave consequences. They show the population can work together without being divided by religious identities. Um, 21st of October, I was writing about the WhatsApp revolution in Lebanon. I was quoting Virilio, the revolutionary contingent attains its ideal form not in the place of production, but in the street, where for a moment it stops being a cog in the technical machine and itself becomes a motor, a machine of attack, in other words, a producer of speed. Have a listen to Ronnie Saikali Raja Yitama Revolution Radio Mix. It's terrific electronic music. The phenomenon, as I said, is spreading like wildfire in large part because of the tinder dry conditions underfoot. Prolonged standoffs eviscerate economies, reducing opportunities and accelerate the negative feedback loop. The Hang Seng Index fell 600 points. Uh, this is from David Inglis. 30 years ago the Berlin Wall fell and we hope that in the future the great firewall of China will also fall, Joshua Wong tweeted. We hope for more and more people who live in mainland China to recognize the importance of universal values and freedom. For some, the Berlin Wall was not really a good day, tweeted Bruno Tertre, of course Vladimir Putin. Joshua Wong told German media, Hong Kong is das neue Berlin. The crusher of bone Xi Jinping is trying to exercise algorithmic control. This is madness. Our photographer has been held at gunpoint by an officer in riot gear. Let's move on to international markets. Moody's changes outlook on UK's AA2 rating from stable to negative. This is the commentary. Pretty damning release as Brexit has been a catalyst in an erosion in institutional strength, which is now seriously undermining faith in the United Kingdom. Sterling um, prices in a downward descending channel. This is according to FX Pip Titan, whose targets are 127.52 and 127.23. We're currently at 127.95. I'm not as bearish as him because I think a lot of the bad news is in the price. Let's turn to the currency markets. Euro dollar uh, 110.24. Dollar index 98.321. Japanese yen 108.96. Swiss franc 0.9965. The pound 127.94. The Australian dollar 0.6850. India rupee 71.3663. South Korean one 11.6134. The real 4.1633, Egyptian pound 16.1432 and the rand 14.9138. This is the dollar index via the market here and it's been a bit firmer than I'd expected. Big speech tomorrow however by Trump. Euro dollar, um, FX pick Titan again he's saying a yellow descending triangle wedge pointing at 109.91. Um, Tesla's Elon Musk and Greenlight's Einhorn taunt each other on Twitter. Dear Mr. Unicorn, fabulous name, Einhorn means unicorn in German, Musk further added that Einhorn made numerous false allegations against Tesla and offered sympathies for a drop in assets under management. Einhorn obviously and Greenlight have been short Tesla. 
And of course, Tesla has been an enormous short squeeze. I've got to commend him for teaching the world about what a short squeeze really looks like. And the parabola, this is Tesla cup and handle formation set up for breakout tomorrow, according to Brandon Osborne. Tesla billionaire super shorts are getting reamed in real time, Lao Tzu charts. Um, and then uh, jumping from there, last week we witnessed some Wizard of Oz level moves in the markets I wrote. And then Bondi Tree CIO says, old enough to remember WeWork bonds trading at 105 in August. Commodity markets gold, uh, which has been very, very weak, 1463.50. And looking a little bit weak. As I said previously, there's certainly a fantasy, even apocalyptic mood afoot. And everyone was charging into safe havens when I was saying that. Now you're seeing gold, the ultimate safe haven, being unwound. Saudi Aramco IPO is vulnerable to Russians to get the best price for Aramco shares. Riyadh needs to stop the oil price from weakening, yet, yet this leaves it at the mercy of Russia and Iraq. Very true. Crude oil futures closed very strong on Friday after a most extraordinary uh, round trip, uh, but we're softening again. We're at 56.60. Pork prices in China rose over 100% in October. That's just incredible. I've spoken about the pork apocalypse and a very fragile food situation. Emerging market currencies are deeply correlated with the yuan, the renminbi. That's what I was writing about on the 13th of August when I was talking about the feedback loop phenomenon. China has exerted the power of pull, I said, over a vast swathe of the world over the last two decades. We can call it the China, Asia, EM and frontier markets feedback loop, which is what's proven by that Bloomberg uh, diagram. Pressure grows on Britain to return its last African colony, that's the Chagos Islands, from a one-storey house with mustard-coloured walls off a bustling road in Mauritius, Olivier Bancou is defying the UK by plotting a return to the tiny tropical island where he was born. As a young boy, Bancou and other roughly 2,000 inhabitants of Chagos were deported to the UK, Mauritius and the Seychelles. The UK argues it can't give up the Chagos Islands for security reasons. It doesn't recognise Mauritius's claim over what it calls the British Indian Ocean Island Territory. The joint UK-US defence facility on the British Indian Ocean Territory helps to keep people in Britain and around the world safe from terrorism, organised crime and piracy, the spokesperson said. The status of Biot as a UK territory is essential to the value of the joint facility and our shared interests an arrangement that cannot be replicated. Zambia's president vows to contain debt within sustainable levels. The medium-term debt strategy has been developed to inform the path for debt sustainability, Lumbu said. As I've said on the 14th of October and previously, the canary in the coal mine is Zambia. And uh, investors have lost faith in government promises to get spending under control and the government has fallen out of the IMF as well and with China. In Zambia, euro bonds are trading at 60 cents in the dollar. Big Saturday read two years after the coup. This month, the month of November, marks two years since Zimbabwe's former leader, Robert Mugabe, lost power to his longtime ally and Lieutenant Emerson Manangagwa in a coup which was orchestrated by military commanders. The Manangagwa regime started with bright promises of a new era, it touted itself as a new dispensation, the Second Republic. Uh, promise of a new dispensation has been nothing more than a mirage. Two events illustrate the perilous nature of human rights in Zimbabwe. The first was the killing of civilians by members of the military and police on 1st August 2018 during election-related protests. The second episode was the protests of mid-January 2019 when soldiers were also deployed on the streets of Harare. Under the Mugabe regime, offenders got protection from prosecution through general amnesties and presidential pardons. More often than not, the protection was through the Attorney General's deliberate failure to prosecute offenders. In this regard, very little has changed. A country that used to feed itself and others is still begging for food. Neighbours who have also experienced droughts, including Zambia and South Africa, are selling food to Zimbabwe, a sign that some of the food shortages are man-made. Talking about the ghost of farm invasion, it's an in-depth article, well worth reading it in full. As I said on the 21st of January, what is clear to me is that Zimbabwe is a tipping point moment. The choice of that moment remains the greatest riddle in history. 
the crowd disperses, goes home, does not reassemble. We say the revolution is over, that's why they're being so aggressive in terms of controlling the street. But the mind game that Zanu PF played on its citizens has evaporated in a puff of smoke. Emerson Mangangagwa, who was eulogising Mugabe as a revolutionary icon, has failed and is frankly as untenable as his erstwhile mentor. This is the bot bus in jolly squares that approaches Zuide, the boxer home, the cup is home, Sio is home. That was such a fantastic victory and they really played really well and I hope that it is a catalyst for the country. South Africa all show up 7.36% year to date, dollar round 14.913, some of that rugby related optimism is now wearing off. Egyptian bound 16.13, EGX 30 up 13.5% year to date. Nigeria targets oil companies for a greater share of profits, changes, redraw the deep offshore and inland basin production share and contract act which had been in force since it was passed in 1993. The new law sets a staggered royalty rate on crude oil sold above $20, rising to the highest rate of 10% if the price reaches more than $150 a barrel. Um, so let's see how that's taken down. Nigerian oil shares down 16.28% year-to-date. Ghana Stock Exchange down 13.2% year-to-date. Uganda's Museveni gives oil firms a month to consider the deal. This is Total, Connock and Tallow who have been in dispute, delaying the extraction of oil over there. Abel Kabore, 35, described the attack as some speaking a foreign language and shouting in Allah Akbar. God is great, raking three buses with bullets after a security vehicle escorting the convoy hit a landmine. Is that speaking a foreign language? That's the problematical issue. Uh, Kenya, the railway development levy has been increased from 1.5% to 2% for all imported goods except raw materials and intermediate goods. Import declaration fees also rise from 2% to 3.5%, that's Bank, bank Ailey. And uh, Reid has bit about funding the SGR. The dollar 2018 issue yield on the 10 years at 6.3% and the 30 at 7.7%. Those are overcooked to the upside uh, in price terms. 2019 issue yield on the 7 year euro bond at 6.1%, 12 year at 7%, exactly the same. Standix PMI index for Kenya for the month of October came in at 53.2 as compared to 54.1. I don't know about the methodology, but it doesn't feel as if the economy is expanding at that kind of rate. Kenya T bill rates 91 day at 6.4%, 182 day at 7.3%, 364 day at 9.8%. NSC is trading at a price to earnings ratio of 12.3 and a dividend yield of 6.5. Nairobi all shares up 14.64% uh, year to date. NSC 20 is down 4.09% year to date. It's all about Safaricom and the banks being strong this year. Thank you for stopping by.